comment from the tree. Okay. Mm -hmm. Support. So the back of the, the, the solution, the looking right. Or the do you want nothing you're going to say in a run? Yeah. <laughs> so, no, no, no. things can come, <laughs> what goes around comes around, back. Here we are together, what, 30, 30 years later? So thank you for joining us, it's great to have you. The next two hours we're giving over to Yaku, because I knew you would have millions of questions, and I knew you'd probably be able to go on talking all day if you got the chance. So I gave him a good long slot on the program. Yaku is married to Magdalene, and they're the father of three boys. They live here in Orania and have been doing so for the last five years. He used to be with Solidarity, and um, he grew up in the Southern Cape in Heidelberg. Presently, he's responsible for marketing and communications at Orania, and he's interested in libertarian solutions to the challenges they have here. We met him and Carl last year in Turkey, we were invited to a conference which Carl addressed. And it was there when we were chatting there that I thought it would be really great to bring this group to Orania, and that's where the, the idea came about. So please welcome Yaku. Yes, thank you, Francis. Um, what a privilege for me, um, especially the fact that um, Paul Bosov himself is also here. Uh, he's the, pre uh, the president of our movement. Uh, and like you've said, his father was not involved in libertarian thinking himself. So there's a strong line of libertarian thinking involved in, in the whole process of, of getting to the idea of Urania and at the end the development of Urania. That's why my question today that I will ask is Urania a libertarian community or not? You know, I will try to delve into that. I just firstly want to say that, um, except for Carl, um, his brother Weinald is also here. Now he is a local researcher, he did a doctor's degree in education. He's also, um, for the last few months, the leader of the Freedom Front Plus in the Northern Cape, um, involved in uh, politics and education and many things in our community. Uh, there's Weinand, then uh, some of you have met Javi. Snaiman Javi is the most open libertarian amongst uh, us in the Urania uh, leadership. He is a um, hardline libertarian, and that's why I've told him, Javi, drive down to Urania, there's something very important happening. I tell you it's his birthday today. Woo! <laughs> So we gave him a big present. We decided to have the Libertarian Conference on his birthday in Urania, you know, what better. Um, then we have Sebastian Biel. Sebastian is our local researcher in the Urania movement. Um, uh, he's the person that I know of the, who traveled the most, or traveled the most since he, not so much since he got married a few months ago, at last, you know. Um, but he's one of those people who can write a book about his travels to Mihanmai, you know, or to places that I never thought that I will, will go to, you know, to the, the countryside of Cuba and things like that, you know. Um, and then next to him is Willem van Us. Willem uh, started working two or three months ago at our local think tank, um, and he's involved with our archive and um, uh, and the books that we have there and things like that. So, also very much um, interested in libertarian thinking. If I just look at things that we read and write and so on. So, uh, we thought we'd bring along this group of people today. Yeah. I think that's all of them. Yeah, great. So, you can think just um, how difficult it must be for me to talk about Rania today. Um, with all of them here, but there's one thing that will be easier, that will be question time. Because I will just send the questions in all kinds of directions. I just want to start... Um, Before you start, do we have the aircon back? Yes, definitely. Uh, you're not getting the full of any experience. You need to control and... Before I start with my talk, I will first show you a short DVD. Um, it's really, it's only eight minutes long, um, and it gives a broad just overview of Rania. Some of you know the town, some of you know absolutely nothing. We'll just give you a broad uh, background so that I don't have to be going to all of this and show you a little pictures. People like pictures today. 
So it's about three years old. Some things have changed. But, um, but yes, this is what I would time. I don't know why. It was never like this. Try control my. Stephen, Stephen, you probably should control minus. But there you go. Yeah, there you go. Okay. I didn't know you can do that. This thing is like very old, you know. Old, in the old times, they made things that never broke. That's why I know. You remember that, you know. I mean, it, it doesn't have Wi-Fi. It still works with an old cable, but it's been working like forever. I, I think you the know? point here is we're a good fit. Exactly. <laughs> yes, yes. Good. Okay, so I'm asking the question, Rania, libertarian community or not, and I've looked on your website, um, uh, and you say that none may deny the hunger of the common people for a peaceful and prosperous life, a life free from rulers and tyrants, from taxes and tolls, from duties undesired and burdens unwanted. I think there's a few um, uh, things in, in that quote, you know, I don't know whose quote that is, um, uh, but that we can relate with, you know, that we can agree with, and you will see why as I... Uh, as I uh, speak a little further on. I, I, I just want to quickly use this one. It's very American, you know, because it talks about Republicans and Democrats. Um, but if you look at our community, I would say that we have in Iranian people in all these different um, places. There's definitely a few libertarians in our community. I would say the vast majority of the people in Iranian somewhere lies around here, more on the conservative, on the conservative side. Um, I know of some people in Iranian who are definitely there, and a few are definitely there. This is the group that I like the least. So I don't, I usually hope that there's no one from them yet, but, but I, I don't know. And this is coming from someone, I must, I must immediately say, um, who worked in 2004 for the Bush campaign in America, you know, for a month long, you know, I worked, I, I, I did that, yes, I agree. Um, uh, uh, isn't it uh, very ironical if, if you need to say that probably the most libertarian candidate amongst the first three or four in the American election for next year is Donald Trump, you know? <laughs> Which you can't really get all this is down there at two or three percent, you know, but amongst Bush and Paul, uh, Bush and Trump and all the others, you know. No, 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 he's not a mysterious but he's, he's yeah. at least a little, um, the no, least that's right, the least yeah, status, you know, he's, he's, he makes the problem, you know, that's something of a theory. But what I do think is that in Urania you will see a lot of this, uh, I sometimes put myself um, in, in, in that category, and that is the sense where libertarian ideas come together with some very realistic challenges of a community, who are still, in a sense, conservative. Um, so you will find many people in Iranian, in my view, also uh, somewhere around there. So uh, that's just um, uh, on that point. But like you can see people sitting here and many others outside, we do have libertarians in our community. And people uh, who, who's been thinking about libertarian ideas for, for very long. Um, <coughs> It's long, but one of my favorite books, and I don't know if you've read that, is The que a, a Quest for Community by Robert Nisbet. Now, that's um, one of the... Uh, I think Robert Nisbet is a, 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 was a libertarian. He wrote this book in 1952. Um, uh, it's very libertarian. Um, I know regularly that libertarians use quotes from the book A, a Quest for Community. Um, but he brings it down very strongly to the need for, for communities, for the localized um, being. Um, and I just quickly want to read two of the quotes from the book. One is he says, I believe it was Napoleon who first sensed the ease with which in modern society the illusion of freedom can be created by strategic relaxation of regulations and law on individual thought, provided it is only individual while all the time fundamental economic and political liberties are being circumscribed. The barriers to the kind of power Napoleon wielded as emperor are not individual rights so much as the kinds of rights associated with autonomy of local community. 
that is where Rolandia strongly comes in and how we're thinking of, of South Africa and the South Africa of the future. Um, voluntary association and political party. These are the real measure of the degree to which central political power is limited in a society. Neither centralization nor bureaucratized collectivism can thrive as long as there is a substantial body of local authorities to check them. That's what we want to do. Uh, that's that's for me very important. And then he says, when he talk more about community, we may regard totalitarianism as a process of the annihilation of individuality, but in more fundamental terms, it is the annihilation first of those social relationships within which individuality develops. It is not the extermination of individuals that is ultimately desired by totalitarian rulers, for individuals in the largest number are needed by the new order. What is desired is the extermination of those social relationships which, by their autonomous existence, must always constitute a barrier to the achievement of the absolute political community. The individual alone is powerless. Individual, will, and memory, apart from the reinforcement of associative tradition, are weak and ephemeral. I don't even know what that word means. How well the totalitarian rulers know it. To destroy or diminish the reality of the smaller areas of society, to abolish and or restrict the range of cultural alternatives offered individuals by economic endeavor, religion, and kinship is to destroy in time the roots of the will to resist despotism in its large forms. I think it's very relevant to what you saw in America for very long, and, and the Indians in America and the Alaska natives, and many of them will agree with you on that, will, will agree with what Nisbet says here. You can go and ask the Inuit or the, uh, uh, any of those Alaska native communities what happened when the, uh, when the American government decided to take over their communities, actually, uh, because the people need education, and the people need um, a different kind of housing, Western housing, and, and people need certain things. Um, and, and in a sense, what the government wanted to do is they wanted to destroy the culture of those people because then they can control that area. And the only re reason why the American government wanted to get involved um, in a very desolate place in the north of Alaska is because there's a lot of oil and gas, you know. And, and so on. And there's many examples that, that we can give that, that I, in my view, strongly relates to this and why um, governments today, totalitarian governments, um, want to destroy cultures and local communities. It's for their own good. It's for their own good, <laughs> yes. Okay, let me now um, go back a little in, into history, and, and I will be short on this, and I will say that um, for us there was a, there's, there's an old flame of self-determination. Um, and it all started with that first farmers in the Cape. Lift, lift the little um, uh, a community in Cape Town and went to farm because they wanted freedom. They wanted to be free from the rulers um, in the castle. Um, after that, again, uh, 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 people went on the great track again because they wanted to be free. Um, there was the Boer War, which was a little war for freedom uh, in a large uh, freedom from, from imperialism. I think you will agree with me on that. Uh, during the Depression, uh, the, the bad times of the 1920s, especially in the 1930s, people again did things because they wanted to be free. Um, they created institutions, they, uh, they've started to do things to, be, uh, to become free. And then Afrikaners thought that they were free after 19, uh, the 1948 um, at the election. And I think Afrikaners were really free. Were really, uh, free. And you will uh, probably agree with me on that. Uh, they uh, they were very strong and uh, for what uh, uh, 30 40 years um, uh, in, a, in a position of power um, but is that real freedom that's that's something for me in the core of the question of why Urania exists today um, uh, are you really free when you just um, have power and, and a certain level of control and my question uh, more and more is uh, were Afrikaners just not only controlled also by their own government, you know? Were, were they really free to, to think and, and say and do as, as they wanted, you know? And, and it's probably not possible. You also had a government-controlled media and, and all of that, things that you know of, you know? So I, 
But I think it's been there for a long time since Afrikaners were really free. Um, Afrikaner thinking in the 1970s and 80s. Now that was the time of, of um, absolute power for Afrikaners. They controlled the whole of South Africa, they had a strong government. If you just think of, of the huge election victories for someone like Foster, you know, um, they were in a very strong position and, and Afrikaners thought uh, that uh, this will go on forever. Um, I think actually what happened was that Afrikaners were in a position of desperate nationalism. Uh, they ended up, because of the history, um, in a position to survive. Their, survi their survival skill was to create a form of desperate nationalism. And that sustained their power up till 1994. Um, and there was a blindness for the real challenges in South Africa. Um, and why do I say that? The, the people who first thought about this idea of Urania, Parle's father and other researchers and people he worked with, um, when they started writing about this ideas um, of Urania uh, in, in the late 1970s and early 1980s, Afrikaners thought they were crazy. You know, we were just in control. We have this whole country. We control this whole place. We're powerful, you know. Why do you want it? have something else. Why do you guys want to have self-determination? We have everything. You know, and that that kind of blindness for the challenges um, in South Africa um, uh, was was really, I think, you know, at a bad, bad point in the 1980s. And then the options for South Africa um, in the 1990s. Um, I think one, uh, and we, we, we tend to forget about that, was federalism. Federal, the ideas of federalism was very strong at one point in South Africa, especially the Encarta Freedom Party um, promoted it very strongly, but, but there was a lot of talk about federalism and the options of, of, of federalism um, in South Africa, but I think, and I think the Afrikaners could, could have um, played a, a much larger role in achieving federalism, but, but they weren't able to do that. You know, they were left without ideas. You know. uh, a year or two before the elections in 1994, most Afrikaners thought they will still control the country forever, you know. They were still in this mind shift and others don't know where, where they were going, you know. So they didn't work with other people in South Africa like like the IFP and others to to um, to get uh, to federalism. Well, balkanization, I think, was certainly also a possibility. It was possible for South Africa to maybe break up, you know. And that was something that I think many Western forces tried to prevent. They wanted one South Africa to go forward, but the possibility of a breakup of South Africa, I think, was, was certainly possible. Um, uh, yeah, I think that's what some Afrikaners even wanted to happen, you know. Uh, then a, a kind of decentralized democracy, and since I've read that, I thought they, I'm not really sure if it's possible, something like decentralized democracy, because democracy today mm -hmm. in the world is more and more about, in, about centralization. You know, and democracy is used by governments just to, at the end, centralize things. So, but if you can get some form of really decentralized democracy, you know, it's also in a sense a form of federalism, but at least a lot of power is decentralized to local governments and things like that. Um, I guess that was what some people hoped for, you know, what at least at one point the National Party and the negotiators were fighting for, you know, at least for some form of, of decentralized system, you know, that we can still control here something or there something. And then um, a new kind of nationalism, a, a, a kind of South African nationalism, or even an African nationalism uh, in South Africa. I think um, we got that. Hmm? Yeah. That's we what got we got. That. Yeah. 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 That's, I, I think at the end that's what we got to. You know. <laughs> yes, we were at the end at a, a new form of nationalism. Uh, in South Africa, I think the whole idea of a South African nationalism failed. You know, um, if uh, what I mean to somehow fight for being South African, you know that that whole thing. Um, but but we do have a lot of African nationalism lately. If you look at uh, at law and things that people say in speeches, you know, and there was quite a shift. Um, uh, I think the first speech where that came out was. Um, Mabeki, uh, Mabeki's speech on two South Africans, the one uh, poor and black and the one uh, very wealthy and white. And I can't remember when that was, but, but that speech I think was, was, a, was a tipping point where African nationalism 
uh, came in very strongly in South Africa. But yes, we, we never saw federalism, we never saw balkanization, we never saw the, a decentralized democracy in South Africa. Now the idea behind Urania, where did it all start? It all started with Sabra in the 1970s, um, where they started thinking about what will happen to, uh, to South Africa if things were to change. Now, the researchers at Sabra said that South Africa will have to change at one point. Now, today that sounds for us very boring. Um, the idea that things were really to change but in the late 1970s um, were not right by Afrikaner standards, you know. Uh, Afrikaners will control this country forever, you know, they thought. So if you say at a conference at that time, if you said that, well, um, South Africa will change, the demographics and everything is changing, a minority can't keep on ruling uh, over a majority of people, um, then, then you wouldn't have had um, majority support. Lots of Afrikaners said, yes, yes, that's going, what's going to happen. Um, but that was the thinking, where everything uh, started, you know. Uh, first, it was race-based, you know, because South Africa were thinking in racial terms, and, and the first ideas were very much based on uh, how will we secure a future for whites in South Africa? You know, what will happen if there's big political changes in South Africa? What will happen with whites? Uh, but it increasingly um, uh, later changed and focused on, on culture. And um, that, that uh, what will happen with Afrikaners? You know, in a, in a bigger South Africa, uh, where Afrikaners will be a small minority, um, how will Afrikaners still exist um, if, if there's big changes in South Africa? Um, well, the, uh, these people um, uh, opposed minority rule. I think that's important. Uh, uh, for that time, it was significant, you know, that people started to say, someone uh, like Professor Bosov said at one point, you know, that a minority can't keep on ruling a majority of people. It was significant at that time. Um, and support for an alternative to just a change of power. Um, they were propagating that in the late 80s, early 1990s to so say we, mu we, we must not just have a change of power in South Africa. Now a democratic election and, and this someone new who comes into power, we must make use of the opportunity to create a new system for South Africa. Something new way that will, that will look different. Now, okay, the whole idea was situated around the word folk start. The whole idea of a new Afrikaner state in the Northwestern Cape um, uh, was very strongly propagated um, by the Afrikaner Freedom Movement, which were created in 1988, um, and which were at the end also the institution that, that uh, bought this town and, and, and started Urania. Um, and then there was the negotiation, the new constitution was negotiated in the 1990s, um, and there was all kinds of efforts by Afrikaners to bring in some form of this into the constitution, and all that that made it to the Constitution were Article 235, that gives the right to cultural and other communities to self-determination. That is still in the South African Constitution. And then the big Afrikaner destruction happened. You know, people never thought that's going to happen, and that actually, there's different points where you could say, when did that start, you know? But probably the one thing that stood out was the election of 1999, when most of the people who voted for the Conservative Party in the 80s went to vote for the Democratic Party of Leon Lowe. Oh, Leon Lowe. <laughs> Tony Leon. <laughs> I want to give you all the... They should probably. Yeah, yeah. But Tony Leon. Tony Leon was, was, was really brilliant in that election campaign. Um, and suddenly the Freedom Front uh, went from hundreds of thousands of votes down to 115,000 or something like that. And, and and that just said to people, oh, what happened here, you know? Was there now some kind of destruction of the Afrikaner, you know? We finished with all of this, you know, Afrikaners don't vote. They go and vote for the liberal political party. You know, what's, what's going on here, you know? <coughs> and then you saw many Afrikaner organizations also that fell flat, you know, and ceased to exist and closed their doors and all of that, you know? And, and, um, uh, and, and there was quite, if you look back today, uh, uh, 10 years or so of what we can call the Afrikaner destruction, the old Afrikaner destruction, the national party that ceased to exist and all of those things. Um, I can keep on talking about that. Maybe we say today that was a good thing. It was a good thing that... It's still got short pants in the department of... Uh, tourism. Tourism. 
Yeah, he's not there, left there anymore. Is he not? No, he was kicked out last year after the election, yeah. yes. Could not have happened to a nicer guy. <laughs> <laughs> I can agree with you on that. Yes, um, so, but, but in a certain sense that's good, you know, because I, I, I think you will agree with me um, that, that if, if you think today, what would have been the role of the National Party today in South Africa? You can't think of something good that they could contribute to South Africa today. So, so the destruction of some institutions and organizations and political parties were probably good. Um, but some of them uh, rose again, you know, and I, I've spoken about the Freedom Front, who got uh, that amount of uh, votes in 1999, and since then they grew again, and a lot of new African organizations um, came to being. I mean, today uh, we see that uh, the largest African organization in the country is AfriForum, now they have uh, lots of members, and they um, they grow by three to five thousand members every month at the moment, um, and they are really becoming strong. And they have well, they were created two years before I left Solidarity, so that's seven years ago. So they seven years old. In the first two years, there were two or three people working there. So seven years ago, a new organisation were created, and today they're the largest Afrikaner organization in the country with 150,000 members who pay dues every month, you know, support them every month. So there was also something new that, that came after this destruction. Okay, but um, yes, I've, I've spoken a little about what happened after 1999, after the big Africana destruction. There was a rethinking of strategy. Um, uh, Afrikaners had to rethink what will be their role in South Africa, and I think that's good. You know, Urania had to rethink what, what will happen here. Urania was bought in 1991, uh, I think 42 people settled here in the first year, and in the first uh, 10 years or so, it grew very slowly, you know, with only a few hundred people, three, four hundred people maybe living here. Um, and people had to rethink their strategy. Um, a different kind of self-determination were, were, were thought of. Um, uh, self-determination is a it's a very dynamic term. Uh, there's, there's a lot of, of different things that you can think of. And, and Afrikaners thought very much one-sided on, on the whole concept of self-determination. So a different kind of self-determination was certainly becoming part of our thinking uh, in Rwanda. Uh, a more realistic approach towards development. Um, and then at the, now in the last two or three years, we came to the idea of the building of a cultural city. Uh, I will give you a book on that, everyone of you here who can read Afrikaans, the book Urania van Dort tot Stad, from town to city, and how are we are going to build a city here, you know, that's our old idea at the moment, we want to, to build a city in Urania. So yes, a lot of things, um, were, there was a lot of destruction, but also a lot of um, uh, great new thinking and creativity came from Afrikaners in the last few years, which I think is very positive. If you look at what some Afrikaner organizations are doing, what they are contributing today to South Africa, I think that's very positive. Now, a little about Urania, wrong perceptions. <laughs> uh, if I can go quickly through them. Uh, racism, isolation, socialism, redneck paradise. Well, some British newspaper wrote that. Um, Afrikaner old age home. A, a desert hellhole, um, failed right-wing project. Now, none of these are my, my words. I, I all took this from, from newspaper reports. Um, apartheid at show, uh, a freedom front pit project, and the showcase of white supremacy. These are all um, what I would say wrong perceptions that people had about Rania. Um, first, racism. Somehow the idea that everything here is built on racism, you know, and and we just look at the color of people, and people are darker than a certain uh, um, thing, you know, will be shown the way out of town, things like that, you know. And we've, we've so many times shown that that's not right, you know. So in my view, that's really just crazy, you know. Uh, uh, some newspapers send journalists here for a week to try and find racism. You know, they say to me, well, I'm here to find racism. I will tell you, well, I, I know a few racists in town, um, so let's make it short. I will take you to them, do an interview, and then everything's finished. Because there's racists in Rwanda. Um, there's racists probably in every place where you, where you come from, you know. 
Um, I can't do very much when the racists decide to move to Iran. It's not my problem. Uh, uh, if he wants to be a racist, he's a racist, you know. Um, so, but but the 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 idea that that uh, what we're doing here in the larger sense are racist, you know, is is something that I think we've proven wrong enough. Um, long enough and, and I'm not even going to go into that. You know, the idea that when you apply to live in Iranian, you need to tick the box where you put your race and things like that, you know, is crazy. The idea um, uh, that comes in also into isolation that there's big walls around this town, you know, and people in old military clothes with big rifles and horses, you know, um, ask for your passport and try to keep certain elements out, you know, that, that kind of thing. Um, there was actually, and I still need to follow up on that, there was a, a lady in America who wrote, you know, I think a master thesis last year. Um, in a master thesis that was accepted by a university, um, that we have razor wire fences around the whole of Iran. You know, um, I mean, that's, that's, I don't know what kind of academic call <laughs> that, you know, but it's pathetic. Um, socialism, that's very interesting. Now, um, the, the idea that we uh, we have some form of new national socialism here, you know, uh, amongst us, um, is also quite wrong. You know, we have, um, and I will show you a few statistics later on. But I think we are one of the most vibrant communities in South Africa when it comes to entrepreneurship, small business, people who start small business. You know, these at the moment less than a one thousand three hundred people living in Urania, and we have more than one hundred and twenty. Um, you can just work out how small the businesses are. People just start all kinds of small businesses because they feel there's a, there's a climate in this community for me to start a small business that I work for myself and where I can um, employ one or two or three people. So, um, but there were mistakes made on that point in the past. There were a time in the 1990s when the Rania Town Council actually had to give you a, um, a, a license to operate a business uh, and to make sure that there's no competition, you know. So if you wanted to open a shop, no. you get the license. <laughs> no one else can get the license. You know, there was a time. Was it this uh, really? Would it yeah, there was competition. That is not prepared. Was it not prepared? The first market is naturally when there are no markets. Yeah. But then can you be able to the client base is vertrouwen om jou markt onvrij te houden? Yeah. But there was competition. Okay, so there was some form of competition, but it was limited by licenses. Yes. Um, now there's no limits anymore, you know, so people can, um, can actually start a business where it doesn't really make sense that there's, I mean, you do a lot of market research, but, but you have the opportunity to start your own business. Okay, I don't know if I can say much about redneck paradise, you know. Um, <laughs> well, maybe this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> but this, 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 um, this idea of, of looking and looking at the community and saying, oh, these are rough poor people, you know. You know where this all comes from, actually? It comes simply from the basis that all labor in Iran are done by Afrikaners. You know, and to see a white person, you know, cleaning something or picking something up in a place, you know, uh, that's a redneck pair of paradise, you know, definitely. You know, so I actually want to say to the journalist who wrote that, you're the racist, you know, actually in that sense, you know. Um, if you think that, that for white people to do certain certain work, you know, is just not acceptable. Um, Africana old age home, well, I will show you statistics on the on the age uh, breakdown of Urania. Um, a desert hell of a place. Young Macy's. Hmm? But why are more young races in the door? Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> we still have a problem that, that um, I think we're something like 55% male and 45% uh, women in Iranian, but it's, it's, it's improving as the economy is diversifying. Yeah. So, so there's a lot of competition for good. For nice guys, you know. that's, that's a, um, yes, we are in the semi desert. We are in an area I think that only get about 300 to 350 millimeters of rain a year. Um, but if you drive around town, you will see it doesn't really look like, like a desert. You know, um, uh, we do have some green. <laughs> we actually are, yeah, there's a lot of intensive farming 
um, around you, in Urania and around Urania, um, very successful farming. Uh, this is one of the largest maize and, and wheat producing areas in the whole country. Um, Urania itself planted something like 17,000, the people in Urania, 17,000 pecan nut trees. And um, last year they did have uh, uh, or created a geographical information system for Urania. I mean, they take a lot of photos from the air and all of that, and they were even able to, to um, count the trees in town. And just in the town area, there's more than 10,000 trees. So I don't really think it's a desert. Um, a failed right wing project, this, that's for everyone to, to um, think of himself. I think there was a time, certainly, when, when more people of, of, of a certain political thinking moved to Urania. That's, that's so. Um, I think that, that has so much changed over the last few years that there's more and more um, internal diversity in, in, in thinking, you know. So, so to say that this somehow, uh, that this was a right-wing project, I'm not sure of. There was many right-wing people who didn't like uh, Professor Bossoff and, and, his, and other people for, for their ideas, for, for the idea that, that whites can't rule and all of that, you know. Um, apartheid at show. Um, Urania is very much different from apartheid. It's, it's very, very much different because it believed that uh, that uh, and, uh, that labour, at least, must be uh, everyone must be able to do his own labour. Uh, that's a, a big difference. We don't believe in the superior, superiority of anyone. Um, uh, I can just go on and on and on, but you can drive through town, you can walk through town and ask yourself, is this what apartheid looked like? You know, and I think you will say no. No, definitely not. Um, Freedom Front Pit Project, no, we had a long and good relationship with the Freedom Front Plus, but this is not the project, you know, it's, it's, um, uh, it's a political party that, um, uh, that still support the idea of self-determination and Urania had a good and open relationship for them, with them for very long, but, but they focus also on many other things. And then the showcase of white supremacy, uh, there's no white supremacy when you need to pick up the uh, something at 40 degrees Celsius and build, build your own house or clean your own streets and, and things like that. You know, we, we don't believe in that. You know, that's something that we destroyed long ago and was really just um, simply stupid. Uh, what do we stand for? Respect, dignity, and equal rights of all different people in South Africa. We stand for freedom. Freedom. The word freedom is very important for us. Um, Afrikaners culture. We've spoken about culture in the, the last speech. I think culture is very important to us. But cultural pluralism, that's a term that I personally like uh, to say that what South Africa need is cultural pluralism. The power of community. I've spoken about that. I believe that um, South Africa will be a better place if we really have strong uh, communities. But not strong communities that are created by a government. I mean, the ANC in the last municipal election had the slogan, uh, building strong, together building stronger communities or something like that. And I, I want to say it's not the job of government to build communities. Communities must do it themselves, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think for most things, communities can take their own responsibility. If we were able to do it here in Urania, I think most other communities in South Africa can take the responsibility for their own well-being. Um, we stand for a successful South Africa. Now, that might sound a little strange for you. People um, like to ask us, um, or like to say, oh, you, I guess you can't wait for South Africa to fall apart. South Africa must just fall apart, then Urania will become the solution, and blah, 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 blah. You know? That's not true. I think if South Africa falls apart, all of us will just lose. Everyone will be losers. If, if, uh, if South Africa just become a, a, a really bad place to live in. Uh, we believe that um, we need a successful South Africa um, for communities like Urania to thrive, for other cultural communities to be successful. Uh, good intercommunal relations, that's something that we work on a lot, uh, so that there can be good relationships between different small communities in South Africa. We're actually busy setting up a network um, of, of different communities. There is an agreement that we've signed with the Corsa community in the Eastern Cape, we work with them closely at the moment on economic development, but that's between communities. It's voluntary, um, it doesn't cost anyone anything, 
It's because we want to um, build our, make our community stronger, and they want to make their community stronger and less dependent. We'll say one of the things that they've committed themselves there is to make their community less dependent on government. And I think we must, uh, what we want to do from Urania is to at, at the end have a large network of, of small communities in South Africa who all commit themselves to become less dependent on the South African government. That's something that we need. Um, uh, federalism, oops, uh, sorry, we still, uh, we still support, very strongly support federalism in South Africa and hopefully some kind of political change in the future in South Africa where federalism will be more uh, of an option. Uh, growing self-determination, uh, we say today that self-determination is not an event, it's a process. And what we do in Araya is we say we want to become more self-dependent. So, uh, we need growing self-determination. Every small step that we take. Uh, next year we will start for the first time to do um, uh, after-school training. We start a technical school that we will start to give um, uh, tertiary education in Araya. That's a a, part, a step in, in growing self-determination. Ownership of your own destiny. Everyone, every individual must be able to take ownership of his own destiny. When you get to a point where government is so involved in your personal being and your personal issues, then you lose that, that capability of taking ownership of your own destiny. Um, small government. We strongly believe in small government. Uh, strong institutions community institutions, uh, we have a lot of them in Iran, yeah. cultural or education, safety, there's a lot of, of voluntary small private institutions in Iran yeah, that take responsibility for certain things in our community. Uh, community based education, uh, we've done that from the start, you know, we don't get um, uh, money from the government uh, to try and educate our children, we do it ourselves. Uh, it's difficult. Um, uh, teachers are paid in Urania about 50% of what the government paid teachers, but we do get excellent teachers. We have brilliant teachers here. We we'll probably work harder than most teachers in the government system. Um, at the one school where I'm involved, uh, uh, school fees are only 46% of our budget. The other 54% we make up somewhere every year. Fundraising and all kinds of things. Um, what I'm just trying to say is that, and, and our school fees are 700 rand, 800 rand, and so on per month. Um, what I'm trying to say is a community can take responsibility for, for educating its own children. Let me give you an example of Nyameni in the Eastern Cape, the Kosa community that we work with very closely. Um, uh, the leader in the community, Sapiwu Matlekle, his, his one daughter uh, is a teacher. Um, she's got a master's degree in education. I think she's a brilliant teacher. Uh, she worked at the local primary school, and I really, when I go there, I can say they need her. You know, they can really need her because most of the other teachers are useless. But she's really, really brilliant. She became so frustrated with the government and with all these people coming from all kinds of government committees and things from other towns to come and tell her how to do her job. She. Um, uh, um, <clears throat> stopped working at the school and she got a very nice job at the Western Cape Education Department, sitting in an office in Cape Town uh, while that was our community in the very deep rural part of the Eastern Cape really needed her. <laughs> they had to protect her, but they, they made her life difficult, constantly made her life difficult, you know. Um, uh, and that's because uh, the community don't have, have enough involvement in, in, in owning their school and uh, taking responsibility for the education of their own children. Localized safety structures, we have that in Urania. Um, I think we are an example of how you can, at least to a very large extent, uh, 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 you don't need a South African police force. Um, you can have a community with its own structure and its own individuals, mostly voluntary, who drive around that night, you know, look if there's something strange. That's what we all do in Urania. And, and be safe. And you can do that. Um, uh, localized dispute resolution. Uh, we have our own little uh, legal system in Urania mm -hmm. um, where people, um, uh, when I'm angry about someone who did something wrong, maybe it's a uh, traffic, mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, what's the word? Violation. Violation. 
a traffic violation that someone made and said, oh, that's not right, or I'm angry at my neighbor for, for his dogs barking at 12 at night, or whatever, I um, open a dispute with, with, uh, uh, with that um, person, and then a panel that was elected by the people of Rwanda every year come together, three people, they, it's not necessary for them to have some kind of very high legal um, education. They come together, they listen to all the issues, and first through mediation they try to resolve it, mostly it's resolved, otherwise they can go to an arbitration. Uh, there's also um, uh, the possibility of, of disciplinary action uh, against someone who do something really bad, like stealing or, or something like that. But it's a, it's a, a, a system that were created by the people of Iran, you know. And, and we, in an in a absolute perfect situation, we would like to see that no one from Rwanda need to ever go to a court or South African court or to a police service or whatever to get any of these services. We can do it ourselves and we do it for, for very cheap. You know, it doesn't cost a lot of, of taxpayer money or anything like that. Um, and then voluntary concentration. What are we doing here in Rwanda? We are settling a community in one of the least populated areas of the country. Actually, a part of the country where not a lot of people want to live. Uh, I think if you go and do a, a poll in, in some of the neighboring towns, many of the people will tell you that, that if they get the opportunity, they will leave. Oh, they would love to live, say, in, in Johannesburg or Pretoria or Bluefontein or Cape Town or wherever, you know. Um, so it's not a place where everyone wants to live, uh, this part of the country. It's, it's one of the least populated areas, and we say, well, we ask people to voluntarily come and, and live here and concentrate and to have some form of Africana concentration because there's no other place really in South Africa where Africanas are concentrated. Everywhere else, they're in the minority. Every other town and city, probably. Hmm? <laughs> but but Dimwet is, is, is part of, of Pretoria, part of Chwani, and all of that. You know, that's, and that's a challenge. You're right. Uh, that's a challenge. There's not one place where, where Afrikaners are somehow in, in control. Okay. Our future plans. We want to take Rwanda to 10,000 citizens within the next few years. Um, that's on our current um, town where we have enough land for that. Um, and by that way we want to create a small city rather than a large town. It's for us a big difference, or a lot of big differences between small cities and large towns. Um, and you, you see it many times in, in Europe, you know, you will have a small city um, that has the feeling of a city. It's vibrant, it's small, it's compact, and it has tertiary education, private hospital um, services, all of that. Then you will have a large town, but most of those people will work in another city, you know. Uh, I know a mayor of a large town north of Antwerp in, in, in Belgium, you know, he says they it's beautiful there, but they only want to be a good town. They don't, they don't focus on jobs and economic development, things like that, because everyone works in the city, but it's a nice place to live. We don't want to be that. We want to be a small city where people can work, where children can go to university, um, where you can get good medical services, where we can actually do anything. Uh, that's, that's the kind of place that we want to create. We are very much um, uh, focused on, on what they call new urbanism. It's, it's a concept I think that's a lot talking about, uh, was spoken about in America. Um, about new urbanism and the whole uh, urban sprawl that's failing in America. All these big suburbs in America that's just failing one after the other uh, because they can't sustain it, you know. Um, and now they refocus on, on urbanism and, and the whole idea of people living closer together. Uh, all of that. We, we strongly believe in urbanism. A further emphasis on sustainability. Uh, we're already very strongly focused on sustainability um, in Rwanda. We, uh, like you've seen in the DVD, we, um, I think we were probably the first town. I don't know if there was any other town because it, it was long before it was cool. Many years ago, uh, Rwanda started um, dividing our uh, rubbish, you know. Glass, recycling. Hmm? recycling, recycling plastic and glass and paper and, and metals. Many years ago. Now everyone is doing it, you know, but we started with that long ago. Um, and it's actually bringing in money for the community and things like that. So it makes sense. And there's a lot of other things that we also do to be truly sustainable. Our whole development strategy is also to say, okay, we develop this community 
um, in a way uh, that will be sustainable. The strengthening of voluntary institutions, that was very important. I've, I've told you of some of them on safety and legal and all of these areas. It was uh, important that we, we strengthen those institutions. But when I say we, I talk about the individuals in town. It's not someone who sits here with a lot of money and a lot of power who can say, okay, we must now do this to this institution, or do this there, you know. No, this is the will of the people. Um, a government that is focused on infrastructure, safety, and basic services. We try to limit the focus of government in Orania, but to, for them to do it very effectively. Something that I feel very strong about. I'm also a member of the town council in Orania. And like I've said, there's diversity. Not everyone in Orania agrees on that. At our last meeting, and now I'm talking out of the Orania town council meeting, but it's not that bad, I'm going to give you an example. And there was a proposal on the table from one of the town council members that we must force every household in Urania to buy a fire extinguisher and to put it up in their house. It must become a new regulation and then everyone must be, be forced to do that. You know, and, and there was, first, some people were positive about the idea because there's a problem with fires, you know, and, we, and, and I've just said to people, let's think different about this. I've asked them, let's think different about this. You want to tell people to do something in their houses. You want to force them to do something in their houses. I'm telling you people will react neg negatively to that. What can we do? We can make it voluntary. Uh, and voluntary in the sense of we can encourage in a positive way. Uh, send out a letter to everyone in Rania saying, we've got a fire danger and we're going to encourage people to get fire extinguishers. And we've spoken to three suppliers and they will be in town on these three days. And if you want to buy one, go and buy one. You know. And that was decided. That was the decision. And it was very well possi possible that they could have decided to, to force people to do that. That's what we need to um, prevent from happening um, in Urania. And that's why I say um, we need a government that know, knows its focus, you know, what, what it, it needs to do. Um, as the local government in Urania becomes stronger and, and can do more things. A strong network of South African communities, I've said that. That's for us a, a, a very important priority for the future. As we see many things um, uh, not working out very well in South Africa, we say that, that uh, a solution that we want to bring to the table um, is communities that, that stand up and, and, and start to, to create um, uh, things by their own. You know. a, a community, I would love to see the first uh, community that was that today is very poor and in 10 years from now tells the government no social grant anymore in our town. Mm -hmm. No, we don't want the social grant anymore. We say thank you for the offer but we don't want it anymore. We can look after ourselves. We need to, we need to get to that point. Mm -hmm. um, growing self-determination, becoming more and more, more um, uh, independent in a sense we must produce more of our own food, we must um, do a lot of things that in, in our community that we don't need from somewhere else. And especially that we don't need a government to do. Now, I think in Urania we, we, we're about 100% there, you know. We don't really take about anything from government. I mean, they've, they've resealed the road that runs through here, but it, it's only because it doesn't belong to us. You know, it belongs to the provincial government. But, but for the rest, we, we don't take any municipal grants we are responsible for all of our own infrastructure. We had to do a 7.5 million rand um, infrastructure upgrade to our electricity network last year. And we did that by donations. You know, um, uh, we don't go to the government and say, oh, here's the proposal, because that's what other towns in South Africa do. Now we want the government grant, we want someone's taxes so that we can build a new power network. No, 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 we got donations. Um, uh, uh, to, to, to build this um, new infrastructure. A positive uh, presentation of Afrikaner culture, that's why it's important. Many people are still very negative about, uh, and we see today in places about Afrikaner's language or elements of Afrikaner culture. I think that's absolutely unnecessary. I think Afrikaners moved beyond uh, the place where anything in Afrikaner culture can be threatened. Mm -hmm. I usually mostly see when culture becomes a threat, it's when a government takes responsibility for that culture. Mm -hmm. that's, that's in most instances where I see that, that happen. You know, Afrikaner culture were a threat when there was a government to, who, who looked after the culture, you know. 
uh, it was theirs. And that's the same that happened in many other countries. But if in a country that's so diverse as South Africa, you just give the room and the freedom for people to associate with whoever they want to, and to be part of some culture or not to be part of, of, of uh, some culture, I think then um, uh, culture don't have to be a threat. It's not necessary, you know, to be to be a threat of, of any kind. And then the promotion of freedom in South Africa in general. Now, freedom, like I've said, is very important. But we need to to work together as different institutions and individuals uh, to to um, to work on that because uh, that's probably the biggest threat that South Africa is facing at the moment. Not this or that or that, the things that we hear of in the media every day, we all can deal with a pothole. Um, but if there's enough laws on our books in South Africa that, that our freedom is really um, not there anymore, then, then, then we're in trouble. And we're in serious trouble. Um, and I think we want to create Urania as a community that will, that will show that that's possible, you know. And if it's then at the end necessary for us to break away from South Africa, to show that that's what's necessary, then we will do that. But what will happen in the future, I don't know. But people always ask us now, when are you going to become independent? When are you going to have this or that? We don't know. We work with the reality of where we are at the moment in South Africa. We want South Africa to work. We want South Africa to be a place where people can live free, where there's um, a decentralization of power, uh, where communities can take um, responsibility for their own well-being, then things will be good. If that doesn't happen, then we will move in the other direction. Okay, quickly, just in Urania, we have, uh, this was done uh, in November of 2014, uh, our own local census. We've decided to do a local census. Um, 386 households. Okay, right. Sorry. This is now in Afrikaans. I got this from the town council. Is there any questions? That's all right. So 386 households. This is just in different neighborhoods, and this one is broken up further here. For some reason, there's four missing. Um, and I think that's because some people don't really understand where they live. Now, that may sound strange, but they may live in a different small, they're in the Urania town area, but actually, they're not. They live on this small holding, but they think it's, it's, um, it's this one. It's that kind of, uh, of thing. Then, um, the population growth in Urania, you can see that today, it's probably between 1,200 and 1,300 people. Um, the, the age in Urania, where we differ from um, Afrikaners in the rest of the country, this is much higher. Um, here, it's much lower. We have a problem in Urania that we don't have a lot of, of people, prof young professionals in their 20s and early 30s. The simple reason for that is that we are only 24 years old, this community. Um, and, and it will take time for, for that part of the community to grow as the population grow. Um, then, uh, what does the households look like? 40, so you can say 41% um, is parents with children. So in 41% of the households, it's, it's two parents with children. That's much different from the rest of South Africa. Um, the, uh, single, 33%. Uh, just two parents without children, 10%. So that's the majority of you. So we, we still have that, that you don't have in many other South African communities. Uh, two parents with their children. Okay, we've asked people in Urania, what is your identity? <laughs> um, and we gave them those um, uh, five options. And 52.3% said that Urania is their identity. This is my cultural my identity. So really the majority of, of them don't say I'm firstly an Afrikaner, I'm firstly someone from Iran now. This place makes me who I am. Then you will see Afrikaner, South African, uh, all of them together, and then small amount of people who call themselves something different. Okay, why did you come to Iran now? Um, Afrikaner self-determination and to make a new beginning. One out of every four people who live in Urania came here to make a new beginning. Uh, usually they are people who um, had some terrible experience where they came from. Lost their jobs, whatever, you know, all of that. And they come here and they offer their labor. 
They want to be part of community where they can do something good and do something positive and get something in return for that. Okay, what does the structure that you live in look like? 66% uh, uh, a house on a single um, oh, yeah. lot. Yes. Um, then, and this this has increased a lot since uh, already since 2014, is an apartment in an apartment complex. Because we've added another apartment complex, and we want to try and create, make people living closer together. Um, then houses, um, apartments in the back of a, a plot, and the other ones are smaller. Okay. This is, and now, we looked at the census and what they give us only, okay, so this Urania is the blue, this one is white people in South Africa because that's how the census does it in racial terms. We don't have Afrikaners, and then South Africa, the green is South Africa, all of South Africa. Now, this is where this is uh, interesting. This is you own a property and it's fully paid. You don't, um, uh, that, that's very different. There's very few South people in South Africa who own a property and it's fully paid. In Rwanda, it's a lot of people. Um, that's usually all the older people, <coughs> all the older people in town. Then um, uh, you own your own property, but it's still not fully paid. That's low in Urania because there's a lack of capital available in Urania. That's the only reason uh, we, have, we don't have enough capital available for everyone who wants to buy a house and build a house and things like that. We can go into that. That's a long discussion why there's not enough capital available in Urania. Um, you, rent, you rent a house or an apartment or so, a lot of people in Urania rent. It's a very strong rental market. Um, and then uh, uh, you, put, don't, where, you don't pay for where you live. You know? There's not few, very few people in Rwanda, but in South Africa, you see lots and lots of people who don't have to pay for where they live because they live probably in informal housing. Okay. But if you may ask people in Rwanda who rent a house, who are in the rental market, what are you willing to pay per month for rental? 46% of people say they're only willing to pay between 1,000 and 200 for the right amount. Now, that's probably just people's wish list, you know, when they fill in the census form. That's my interpretation of that. But that's interesting. 20% between 2,000 and 3,000 grand. Now, I don't know of many properties in Rwanda that you can rent at that price. Because the rental market is very strong. Um, some people are actually fighting the free market in Rwanda because rental and, and House prices and all of this went up a lot in the last few years because there's a much higher demand for property in Uralia than what is available. The demand is very strong, so our house prices um, uh, rather looks like the prices in, in cities and not like, like rural towns, you know. You'll pay for a three-bedroom house in Uralia, 900,000 rand. In a town 40 kilometers from here, you will pay 150,000 rand. But there's a demand for property in Uralia. Okay. Yeah, this was very interesting because I don't know of any cleaning people who do cleaning work in Rwanda who get less than 100 rand a month. 10% of them say yeah. they get yeah. less than 100 rand. Ach, per day, per day. Uh, then between 100 and 200 rand, that's a large number of people. And between 200 and 300 people, 21.4%. Okay, level of education in Rwanda. And no education. Um, like current growth, how, how on track are you for that? And secondly, like how? Yeah. With our current growth rate, it will take about 20 years. Um, because we're growing at the moment at about 50%. Or 15%. What's your target for that thing? No, we don't have a target. We, we, we specifically decided not to set targets. We hope that it will happen in five or six or seven years even, you know. Um, but but if it takes 20 years, it takes 20 years. Okay. We're not people who, are, who believe in doom and gloom and South Africa will fall apart in two years' time, so we need to do all of this and this and this. Um, we're, not, we're not in that sense. We would rather want to build something that's sustainable and, and, and good, you know. And we want it to happen in a sense naturally. <coughs> I mean, you can, what we can do is we can bus in a lot of, of these this thousands of poor Afrikaners living in some of the cities in, in kind of squatter camps, you know, and bust them in and just place them here and then suddenly we have 5,000 people. But we don't, we don't really want to do anything like that. Okay, but, but is there a plan to like create, to either like remove disincentives um, where there are other disincentives? Yes. What, yes, is, yes. what is your plan? Like, I mean, yes. I've seen photos of 
you could buy it 20 years ago and today, and I mean, mm -hmm. no, 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 you could probably do it in 20 years. But oh. Yes, yes, thank you. Okay, we, we're currently working on what we call an economic development plan um, that it's actually are doing that, you know. It's not it's not uh, the kind of economic development plan where you say we must have public works projects or anything like that. Um, it will be finished by the end of the year and it looks at what is the bottleneck at the moment. Why are some people not not um, visiting around yet? To give you an idea, three years ago you had terrible cell phone reception here, no 3G, um, no ADSL internet, um, and, and no one operating a business that are quite dependent on on the internet could, could carry it. Today we have someone, um, uh, we, have, we have a lot of people in, in that area. We, we actually just went to and fight with Telcom. For two or three years we were fighting with Telcom and we were the first town in this whole part of the, of the Northern Cape who got ADSL internet. But then they came and they only gave us 30 ADSL lines. Now they said for a town that are, have a thousand people, mm. 30 ADSL lines are enough. We've said to them that we're not a typical South African town, we're different. And we have lots of small businesses. So now, last week, they came and put in a new one with 300 lines. Mm -hmm. Because they've got enough applications in Uraya to, to sell all those 300 lines. And, and there's only 1,300 people living there. Mm -hmm. so, so we try to get rid of all those bottlenecks. We, we've spoken to Vodacom, they've put out a, a, a new um, tower. MTN just did it last week after lots of letters and things like that. And, and so we, we work on all these bottlenecks and things that stand in the way of progress to get that out of the way. Okay. Oh, sorry, oh, biggest thing that stands in our way of progress in Rania is the fact that we pay taxes. <laughs> we pay income tax. We pay. Um, we don't. We have one small exception, and that is that we don't pay local taxes. Mm -hmm. um, and with only community, probably in South Africa, we have that kind of arrangement that we don't pay rates. through a local government taxes. You know, you pay rates. Rates. Yeah, rates. Sorry, mm -hmm. that's rather yeah. municipal rates. Yeah. We don't pay. Uh, yeah, we don't pay to the to a South African municipality. Mm -hmm. You know, the government say that we're part of a municipality. We say no, we are. And we actually had a court case about that in 1999. So they don't tax us on that. We do pay in town for our own services. Are so yeah. you classified as a <laughs> No, no one knows. Uh, yeah, so that's good. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, um, we actually have a good relationship with the municipality that we're forcing. Which is very good. Most of the municipalities in our area are very dysfunctional, you know, so they're very much afraid that they must start uh, delivering services here, you know, because it's going to be a crisis for them. And good for them, that, you know. We also, we maintain good relationships with all our politicians, with the Premier of the Northern Cape and everything, and on the other hand, we, we're going on and doing our own thing, you know. We just don't pay rates, we create our own infrastructure, deliver our own water and electricity and all of that, and in town, and it works very well. Is there a threat to that? No, not at the moment. In the future? There may be a few. Oh, certainly. Because everywhere where people are not paying some kind of rate or tax, someone will get uh, to a point where you, you will want that. Maybe a new mayor in that town will say, oh, there's a place where I can get a lot of money from. You know? Not at the moment. We're small. You know? There's a lot of poor people in Iranya who earn 4,000 rand a month. Or something like that. But we may get to that point. Yeah, I'm interested in your relationships with other communities. Yes. What sort of things are you doing and thinking about? Yes. Because that obviously speaks to your target of encouraging more communities to be sustainable. And yes. Okay. That, that's very important. Uh, I'm going to take Nyamini as the example because that's the community where the relationship has been the longest. Yeah. Is How that, did that start, by the way? That's okay. Relevant. Okay, very interesting. The leader of Nyabini um, spoke to a guy from the Western Cape, somewhere in the Western Cape, who came to his community to trade tour guides. And he said to him, do you know a community in South Africa that's very independent? They're a little like the Vatican. You know, that was his exact, his exact words. And that's where it all started. And um, what's his name over Louis Willems, who did the training there, said to him, yes, I know Urania, and yes, the number, you know. 
and he phoned us, and he visited us, we visited Miamini, uh, and we got to the point where we signed an agreement, and now there's three uh, constant visits. I mean, our uh, general meeting in Urania this year was, he was the speaker, Mr. Metetle from Miamini, and what do we do? I mean, we don't talk about um, big projects, we don't talk about um, uh, any, um, uh, because what he tells us, if you live in a community like that, there's usually two focuses. Um, the one is getting money from government and getting money from European NGOs. You know, there's, there's nice building in their community that stands labeled by some kind of European NGO, but it doesn't serve them in any way. Mm -hmm. Nothing. It's a big community hall that they built there last year. But what must they do with the community hall? You know, it's now there, and now they must maintain it, you know, and so on. That's not what we talk about. We talk about um, uh, real bottom-up economic development um, in a community like that, you know. So we, when we go there, we walk around in Yemeni and we, and we ask ourselves, we and them, what, what is the potential here? I mean, they live to two and a half thousand people, but there's not a single shop. You know, not a single shop. There's a beautiful dam with trout in the dam, but there's no tourism. Mm. They're in the Amatolas, you know, it's a beautiful part of the country, but there's no tourism, no tourism facilities, nothing, you know. So we uh, look at um, opportunities, you know, and, and what can be done. The one thing that we've um, established so far is that they've created a, co a cooperative. Community cooperative. At, an, at a meeting, a community meeting last year, the community decided to create a cooperative, and people are voluntarily joining the cooperative. I think about 200 of the people in the community joined it, and they pay, I think, 10 rand or what, a month into the cooperative. And they've now started small things a small business, a small shop, spas are shop, they've started things like that. A cooperative started that. That was the idea that we gave them, because it worked in Urania. Our bank, today in Iran, we have our own bank, right? we have our own money, we also, I guess you saw that aura. Um, the bank in Iran started as a cooperative, because none of the commercial banks in South Africa wanted to operate here. Today we say thank you, you know, um, but now we have our own community bank, and it only started as a small cooperative. Today it's, a, it's what they call a, um, a cooperative community bank, something like that, registered with a reserve bank and all of that, because we were coming to be. And, can we, can we bank through it as well? I'm often um, irritated with my bank. <laughs> <laughs> what is interesting is that um, the, the Reserve Bank prescribed that you must be part of a community to be a member of that bank. So you must somehow become part of that community. And at the moment, what works is to be a member of our movement. Someone who's a member of the Urania movement may, may use that bank. Because in a sense, that you associate with this community. Some shares in post boxes. <laughs> no. <laughs> we do sell Iranian memberships. Yeah. <laughs> what is your major source of income as the council? What are your rate, the rate of your rates and taxes? Okay. If I could ask two questions, Ooh. and the other one is, what do you see as your biggest threat for your survival? Okay. 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 Our main income uh, is from well, our main forms of income is firstly from a from rates that people pay for services that they use. Um, in that sense, I can tell you that there's a number of houses in Rwanda that are totally off the grid. I mean, I, I would think probably that with a town in, in, this, in South Africa with the biggest percentage of houses that's off the grid. I can't think of any town in South Africa where there's more, because I think there's at least 10, 15 percent of houses in Rwanda are off the grid. Why? Because then they don't have to pay for certain rates. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and not, that's not the only reason, but, but that, that's, that's also the case. So yes, but we do get rates when people make use of certain services, they, they pay for that rates. Um, for instance, I don't make use of the um, uh, Phyllis for this, um, refuge, refuge, removal. refuge removal, you know, so I don't pay for that. Is there a standard property rate if you own a... There's the, yeah, that's the one thing. There is a standard rate, and we don't call it a property rate, we call it a general... Levy. 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 A general levy, and that is for the maintenance of public spaces. Roads, um, all the things that everyone, we suppose, uses. Um, so, it's in the public. That differs from, I think it starts at around 400 rand, it will go up to about 
1,000 grand probably. It's in that, in that area. Depending on the, on the size of the plot and the, and what the house is worth and all of that. Yes. That's right. It's probably Yes. People do own their property. So yes, no, 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 that's, a, that's an important question. Um, uh, how does ownership work in Iran? Yeah. We have a, a scheme that, that don't, not many people know of anymore, but that we believe works very well and that we say our ownership. It's definitely private ownership, <laughs> uh, but it's not ownership like we know it. And it's called the shared block scheme. We registered, the whole town is registered as a shared block um, with different shared blocks, and when I buy a house, I get a shared block certificate. And that's registered in my name. You know, so someone in Iran can't take it from me. In law, of course, it's only a contract. So yeah. in law, they're only then use contracts. Yes. Yeah. 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 Oh, the biggest threat. Um, what is the biggest threat? Um, there's so many, you know, if you really think about threats, you can think about a lot of negative things, you know, the Orange River being cut off somehow, we don't have water. Um, uh, some kind of uh, well, political turmoil. Yeah, political turmoil can be bad for us, you know, in South mm -hmm. Africa. But that's already the case. We already have in a sense political turmoil in South Africa. Squash <laughs> invasion. That's certainly a possibility, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know why people want to come and live here. You know, it's really one of the coldest places in South Africa in the winter, one of the hottest places in South Africa in the summer. People really want to, must want to move here because they want to for some reason. Um, that's that what makes up a rather different. We don't think a lot about threats. Um, uh, we, uh, maybe some people, I don't know, some people um, think we don't think about threats enough, but we don't think about threats that, that much. I think um, the biggest threat probably will be when, when our people in, in town who are economically active will not be able to do that anymore. You know, I'll give you an example. My wife has a call center. She started a call center in Urania three, four years ago. Um, uh, if telecom, some uh, the if telecom infrastructure just falls apart, she will have a big crisis. And, and I know there's other alternatives, but not here. <laughs> not here. Maybe some Satellite, satellite communication? Satellite. She's the yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's the only alternative really at the moment. New tell and all these other guys are the alternatives. But but yes, something like that will then become a, a, a that's the kind of things you know if it's difficult if it's impossible for us to export our hundreds of tons of pecan nuts you know that that's that's great yes Andrew I mean sorry maybe you were first no okay Andrew just excellent talk I very much enjoyed it. learned a lot from it two quick questions and a comment first question why did you give this talk in English. Second, the second question is, have you got the Gini coefficient for running it? From those things there, you can easily work it out. The CSB is probably one of the best in, in the world. Just a comment, you spoke about apartheid and how this is different. The key thing about apartheid was that it was a socialist system. State control, state planning, Sassel, the state uh, regulation of labor, past laws, exactly like communist Russia and so forth. Yes. I think it's very important to realize that. And this is nothing like that. Exactly. This is more like capitalism. I agree with you absolutely. The Gini, we don't have that, but it's very interesting. We must work that out. And yeah. I agree with you on that. Okay. That we don't need we don't need a minimum level to, to achieve that. No, we yes. had one in Iran yeah, yes. years ago. But it just um, what was interesting, the minimum um, uh, wage, wage, wage uh, became unnecessary because there was a natural um, competition for labor in Europe. Yeah. There's quite competition for labor. I can tell you that if you want to have someone really good who can work in your garden on a Saturday, you're going to pay. You know, I do that. I have 300 grades for someone to work for a few hours on a Saturday, um, and it's someone really good, someone very nice. Um, and you don't have to have a minimum wage for that, you know. So we don't have a minimum wage anymore. We don't. It's not necessary um, anymore. Um, yeah. So it's, it's possible with an alternative. And but I, I fully agree with you on, on apartheid South Africa and, and socialism. And that's I mean, absolutely a fact. And remember, just I think uh, we we don't always acknowledge how that kind of thinking was still part of Afrikaner thinking um, in the 1990s. And that's why certain things also happened in Iran. Yeah that were in a sense a little socialist, because people were thinking about that. Um, 
uh, one of my colleagues who are not here today always say that Afrikaners wanted to think from the top to the bottom, and not from the bottom to the top. You know, they always wanted to create something, and then the something must do things for for them. You know, we, we stop that thinking. Uh, I mean, I just wanted to oh, earlier when we talked about the rights and rights and taxes and municipal rights. I was just wondering that the, the the biggest problem we mostly face is the sales problem. Um, so if you generate income in, in this town, obviously sales would want the cut of it. Yeah. So do you, you know, I suppose you just submit your normal returns like everybody yes, else? We do. Really, that's that's our biggest bottleneck to development in Rania. Remember, we pay for everything ourselves in this town. We look after our own roads, our own sewage plant, our own water filtration, our own education at schools, our health care. Everything is paid by these people who live in this town, but then they pay all the, the, the taxes also to government. If we can just get some of that back. Um, sorry, uh, when, when the, we've, we've got very good friends in South Tyrol. It's a province in the north of Italy semi-autonomous province, they were part of, of um, the Austrian-Hungarian um, uh, Empire till the First World War and then they were annexed by Italy after the war, actually given by the British to Italy and they're German speaking and they Austrian and they don't feel home in Italy I can tell you the long story but when things really changed for them is by the 1970s or 1980s when they got to the point where they got 80% back of their taxes today it's 90% now they're so nice, they've got huge surpluses at the moment. They give some of it back to Italy because they're afraid that some things in Italy can go so wrong that it can be bad for them. They've got huge surpluses. The unemployment rate is 1.3%. They're the highly, most highly educated um, province in the whole of Italy. And their capital, Britain in German or Bolzano in Italian, many of you probably haven't heard of the place in Europe, is the most livable city in Italy for the last three years. Um, uh, and, but, but yes, that's uh, what, what we've learned from them is that if, if you get to the point where you're strong enough to negotiate for that, that getting that taxes back, you know, then, then you can do a lot of things. Yes. I've, I've been a member of uh, the Urania movement for the past 10 years, um, but I'll never live here. I'll, oh, I say never, we know it's not going to happen. <laughs> um, it's highly unlikely that I'll ever live here because I don't feel that much uh, akin to, you know, I'm an atheist, I'm uh, different. Um, and my question that I want to ask actually links to it. What would uh, the community's reaction be if I said I want to uh, purchase a property here, yeah, but I want to grow it down, and I do want to sell it, and I might even want to have a brothel in the backyard. <laughs> what do you think? Yes. The, the processes would be and how will I be treated and yeah. apart from whether it will be successful, I think it will be successful. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but it's not for you to say. <laughs> what do you think the outcome of, of, of that uh, application now would be? I want yeah. to buy a property in Iran. Yeah. Can, I, can I ask a question that adds to this? Yes. So I yeah. wanted to know is how fully transferable or, se or seedable Yes. the contracts under your uh, shared lot scheme are, whether there are preconditions for transfer and ownership, whether zoning implications are implied in the terms and conditions of those shared lot contracts. I think that's similar to what you're asking, isn't it? Yes, sir. Okay. First of all, to answer that question, I think what is important to understand is that Uralia is very much self-regulating. The self-regulating community. We, um, we have some shops that are, that are open on a Sunday. But most of the shops in Rwanda are closed, but not because they're forced to be closed, it's because it's their preference, you know. You will see on Sunday the filling station open, only opens at 12, because the owner feel that people must go to church in the, on a Sunday morning, you know. So the filling station only opens at 12. And, and that's, that's his way of, of doing things and, and, and people accept that. So when someone with ideas that may be a little strange to the rest of the community come to Rwanda, um, the success will, in a sense, lie with, with his ability to, to um, make the rest of the community understanding why that, is the, why that is the case and to get people to accept that, you know. Um, we, it really happens that, that someone do something so bad and so different that, that we need to take someone out of the community, you know. It, 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 
happened once or twice, you know, but that's in a case of a serious crime or something like that, you know. So um, you won't regard the marijuana as a serious crime? <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's different uh, opinions on that. And, and, and when you say you, that's the community. That's the individuals who will have to determine that, you know. And probably the vast majority of, of the community will, 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 will differ with me on that, you know. That's, that's my, my, my thinking. Uh, how does it work if you want to come and live in Urania? You, um, you apply to, to live in Urania, and there's a panel of three uh, other citizens of Urania who are not on the town council or anything like that. Normal people from Urania who talk to you. And they, they ask, why do you want to come and live here? You know, and will you be comfortable with this and that? And remember, we do things this and that way. And then they give you permission to live here. Or they deny you permission. It's a precondition for contractual purchase. Yes, that is. Yeah, yeah that's that is that's important. So you need to get from this panel. You need to get um, uh, from life. Yes, how we just want to add. Yeah, I just want to solve that, that brothel question. First of all, I would be opposed to it. So what I would do is I would arrange with, with all the businesses to stop supplying you anything. <laughs> I would go to the local churches and ask the pastors to knock on your door at the. <laughs> Most conspicuous times at night to try and convert you to Christianity and in the end you'll feel so un unwelcome here you'll leave yourself. <laughs> That's <laughs> why I work there. Carl Bullets my people. You know. Okay. So the, yes, there's that's the precondition, you know. And the point is those people's subjective viewpoints could be unconstitutional. Yes. Yeah, you know, they could be discriminating on the basis of gender, sex, race and those type of things, yes. and it would be not stated, of course. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's true, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Um, so so the, just for instance, I'm very glad that you say you're a member of the Rani movement, but what made you uh, join the Rani movement? Oh, I'm on, I thought I was an Afrikaner, and I thought uh, oh, this might be uh, a little bit of insurance. Uh, <laughs> 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 so, so, so I've been tracking your progress, uh, and uh, yeah. yeah, that's a good point. Yes, yeah. excellent. Okay, yeah. So, so, so back to the taxes. Do you yeah. have? Okay, first of all, do you have a plan to eventually get your taxes back? And secondly, if you get the taxes back, who gets the taxes? The guy who paid the taxes, he get his tax back, or do you guys like a minister on his ground? Yes. You see, that's the thing in South Tyrol. The people pay very high taxes, and the government of the province are getting the taxes back. Mm -hmm. So what is happening there now, in the last few years, they've always been, remember, they, they were a province that's, uh, that, that were um, for long um, oppressed, especially by Mussolini. Mussolini changed all the German names to Italian names and things like that, you know. And then they fought for self-determination, so they stood together, and then they got, got all this freedom, and now they're a little angry at each other. Starting to get more and more angry at each other. Not at each other, but at their own government. <laughs> their own German government, because they, they controlled everything, you know, um, in a sense. No, I think a, um, they, they, there must be some kind of an alternative. How do we get to that? Um, we need to get bigger. We, uh, uh, that's, that's our first thinking. We, we haven't even tried to negotiate that with government at the moment because we say we don't think government will listen to a thousand people who say we want to get our taxes back, you know. Um, but if we're a little, a little bigger, we have a little bit of um, uh, uh, skills at that, then we can certainly start to negotiate with government and you negotiate in different, different ways. You can even take it at the end of a dispute. Um, and, and some will get that back. Um, personally, I would think that it will be great if um, if people can get their taxes back themselves. But then you will have to find ways in the community to generate, still generate income for certain things. But we are doing it at the moment. Yeah, like, but what, I mean, like, you're generating it. Yeah, exactly. You will you will still need to be able to do that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I'm not saying then we need to have new taxes. I mean, if that happens, we will probably be. At, be a, a wonderful place to live in with the lowest, some of the lowest taxes in the world. If, that, if, if individuals get all their income taxes back and, and other taxes, and they only pay this little rates that they pay at the moment. Okay, but you guys have a plan currently to get there. No. Can I maybe answer that? Yes. yes. Maybe one first step would be to avoid taxes by, by direct trade. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. and growing more of your own necessary necessities and uh, avoid the value added tax and all that. 
I would just like to differ with the, with the, with the view that you should wait until you're bigger because, because you know, know how with guns as these things work. The, the more successful you are, the more money is going to be in it for the state. And I think the least likely they're going to be, the least likely they're going to be to actually get anything back. Yeah. Whereas while you're small, and you can actually go to them and say, look, we're a town of a thousand people, we pay all these taxes, but we look up, you know, we do this, 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 and this, and you don't have to do this, this, and this, and this. We will tar this road from mm -hmm. the well to the town. Please give us our million bucks back. <coughs> then they might just do it. Yeah, but it them it's nothing, but by yeah. the time it's a hundred million, mm -hmm. Uh, they're probably going to be very hesitant, but if you grow naturally from the base where that is the accepted thing happening, by the mm. time you get to the mm. 100 to 200 mm. million to get back, then that's been the case for 20 years, then mm. the plot might carry on. But you can't tell them that because you're not a town, you're a share block scheme. Yes. Mm. Yeah, but you also you're a private community, I mean, it's a private you're piece a community, of land. You're a share block scheme. Yes. That's, no. your, that's your classification. Yes, yes. No, but you also have the constitutional right to self, you know, that. You know this article in the yes. constitution which you work on. So, can you use, possibly use something about that, combined with the fact that you pay for everything yourselves, mm -hmm. and then try and get some sort of agreement, maybe fifty percent tax back or something. And by the time you're bigger, then that's already the. There's a lot of internal debate from time to time about that. You know, when to do what, when mm -hmm. to make what move, mm -hmm. and things like that. I think yes. that's your greatest risk: yes. the lack of property rights mm. and the ability to grant them. And no. the fluidity of your shared block agreements and their dependency on subjective criteria. I'm not going to come to the thing where people yeah. can decide without my. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's okay. We say we're a voluntary opt in community. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. people can voluntarily opt in. People have to can decide that for themselves. And your growth is going to be the to people to decide. Yes. I want to, to add another level to the question regarding property rights. So not, not arguing uh, so much in favor or not in favor of, of the share block scheme because that's just the form that came by and we, we started using it. Uh, it delivered uh, for us for the past 25 uh, years. Um, we haven't had any single property dispute uh, in or around Arania uh, in terms of the, of, of, of the system. But, but the layer of thinking that we need, when you think about a, 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 a scheme like Verania or a project like Verania, is the question of the property um, regime. Within which property regime um, uh, do your own property right uh, fit? Um, and, and at the moment, if you talk about property rights, as we know it, you talk about property rights in terms of the South African property regime. Mm -hmm. What we have created with the share block scheme in this case, and maybe it's not so easy to, to replicate it, but, but we have this very uh, successful small experiment in terms of it, is a separate property regime that operates with share blocks, which is administered by ourselves as a, as a company. So we, we found a specific little niche somewhere where we could take those actions that we need to, to take by ourselves. If we have to look at another kind of, of, of property right, um, for us that couldn't mean just reverting back to South Africa guaranteeing it. We have to create another property regime that we guarantee and administer on our own terms. It could be shared block or it could be something else. We are um, looking into alternatives because we need alternatives as well. But we focus on the property regime more than the property right itself uh, as a question at the moment. Um, just on the property thing basically, I mean really the fact of the matter is I mean governments with great property rights have been overthrown and those guarantees have gone away. I mean the basis for libertarian thought is that we own what we produce. I mean, and other people have arbitrarily ended your property right and yourself for killing you. Mm. You know, I, I really think it boils down to whether or not, you know, has it happened? What is the real likelihood of it happening? I mean, if Irania was a place where constantly that was violated, you know, mm. constantly they kicked out the shoals of, of Irania, you know, then, then I totally, I totally concede the point and say it's not safe to come over here. There's, there's no point in it. And if there was any, like, obviously stated intent, then again, the same thing applies. But if the idea is, listen here, this person actually owned it, you know, and the whole community actually saw it and, and the governing body of it decided for some arbitrary reason to remove it. 
I hope at least that your community would kick up a storm against yeah. that type of yeah. a situation. No, but they will. And it hasn't happened in 25 years, and I can't see at the moment how, how it will happen. Of course, here in Rally, I feel strongly about the property rights, which I know is only in a shared block scheme, but, but you don't feel like yeah. that. Yeah. Well, I mean, there were many problems with people that own property, but only with people that rent or that just pass by or work here for a while or so. Because they're the stable people that are talking about the community. What I can add to that is we believe that you that you really add happy and successful people to this community when they own something in Rania. Yeah. We had a scheme earlier this year where our no, a non profit organization in town came together with the, with the cooperative bank to create a scheme where uh, people, working class people, not working, People with a lower income in the building <coughs> sector could um, get their own piece of land um, in town and build their own house there. Uh, and we gave them the deposit for at no interest and things like that, you know. And it worked out very well. So much that it was sold out quickly and we need to add more to that, you know. The, the land was serviced by the town council but at less than cost price. So they didn't make any money out of it. So they put out all these plots at a very low price, 50,000 rand plot. Uh, fully serviced, water, electricity, um, sewage, all of that, um, and, and that worked very well because we say when someone have their, uh, owns, owns their own plot and their own house, then, then they become people who really contribute to the community, yes. Yeah, that's just the bank. Just tell us how it started and how effective you think it is. I presume it's a bank that supports those small businesses that we saw here. Yeah, yes. But I'm very interested that the community came together as a bank and they're promoting the home, which ultimately, I mean, you need a bank. Yes, so please tell us about that. And then religion. Now, I'm a sympathizer, unlike maybe most libertarians, <laughs> because I, I, I'm a Christian. So I don't believe that libertarian ideas are necessarily against God or religion. What role do you think it plays in this community? Mm -hmm. And if somebody came then with a different religion or an atheist, do you think that would be a problem uh, to live here? And then the third point is, I'm just one of those people happy that you spoke in English, because my first question to Francis was, is the seminar going to be in English? Because if it's not, I wouldn't be able to come here. <laughs> not because I don't want to learn Afrikaans, but I just wasn't born where it's spoken. Okay. Um, and I also truly believe that, you know, much as all of us were oppressed by the British, there is one useful thing about English, Absolutely. and it can bring people together, and they can talk and understand. And I've learned a lot. I come from a community very similar to the Afrikaans community. In my knowledge, it's like I share a lot of your sentiments and how you feel. Otherwise, I don't give another time. So I appreciate that. Okay. Well, it gave me the opportunity to exercise my English. Because <laughs> <laughs> so after living here for five years, you know, I mean, I, I've actually studied in English and all of those things, but after yeah. five years here, you, you start to use your verbal um, ability a little. Um, so yes, that's, that's, that's a pleasure, but you're also going to learn a few new Afrikaans words in the next two or three days. Sure. Of course, you will see most sites in Rania are only yeah. in Afrikaans, mm -hmm. and all the restaurants, the menus are only in Afrikaans, and so on. So that will also be an interesting experience to you. Um, uh, on the bank. The bank, and, and my colleagues can correct me, started when, in the beginning, APSA, in Petrusville, and they don't exist even anymore, that branch. They came here for one day a week, for in the morning or so, and they learned a little bank service. That was a time when commercial banks still did that in the 1990s. Now it doesn't exist anymore. They stopped doing that, and then the owner of the fuel station started with an ice cream bucket, you know, um, with a little money in it. And people brought their checks to him, and he gave them cash, and then once in a few days he drove to Hopetown to pay in the checks into his own bank account, and then they started looking at, but what can we, we need something? And they, they've started a um, spa in credit cooperative you know, savings. That, that was incidentally just at the time when the Department of Trade and Industry yep. had, uh, launched a new act on um, uh, community uh, spa and credit unions, yep. savings and credit unions, which did not exist as such in South Africa before. They sort of formalized the stock fells. Um, amongst people in, in black communities often um, by these unions. And it operated as a union for around about 10 years under the auspices of trade and industry before it got to a scale which, which uh, made it necessary according to their own rules to, to um, transform it into a bank, 
which, which was a cooperative bank, meaning that everybody is a member of it. There's no shareholders that, that take uh, the cream off the crop. Um, it's, it's a community kind of thing. But sorry, just to, to, yeah. to bring in that part of the yeah. trade that industry. Is, that's, that's very it's important. It's a very see. interesting thing. The way in which Veranda constantly watches its, its environment to see where the uh, uh, occurs an opportunity that you could take. This is a classic op uh, opportunity created by a government which we didn't like much, but <laughs> used as, as, as we could. Yes. So the profits of the bank are owned by the community, are, are belong to the community? Yes. There are no sh but, but, share but, but, no, Yes, now I must, I must okay. further, okay. Uh, because then Urania got the Urania Savings and Credit Union. That, that, that was created, owned by the... Uh, um, regulated by the Department of Trade and Industry, owned by the community as members. You became a member of this union and then you can do basic transactions. But only limiting it to, I think, 50 million rand, if I were correct. It's capital. Uh, yes, the, the capital of, of this bank. Well, it been a bank, we were not allowed to call it a bank. So it was not allowed, it was uh, uh, supposed to be, you, you were supposed to call it a credit and savings union. That, that was the name. Then, um, if I'm correct, the Reserve Bank came up with uh, a, a, an idea to create cooperative banks. And there was a new old department created within the Reserve Bank, um, and we were the first or the second. There were two cooperative banks uh, created in South Africa. Ours had one at the Buffalo King in Rustenburg, if I'm correct. I think so. Um, so the, the Urania um, Savings at Credit Union were changed into a cooperative bank, the Urania Cooperative Bank, because we, our capital grew over 50 million in rand, and we were not allowed to be in this union anymore, but we had to go on. Um, I think still, till today, there's only two of them. I don't know if there's, maybe in the last few months, others also, but there was only these two um, cooperative banks registered with the Reserve Bank, um, and today, and, and that still works at the same premise. There's no, um, the, the, um, uh, it belongs to the community, you're a member of the bank, you own the bank, everyone is a member or an owner of the bank, um, and the bank uh, put, put back its surpluses into the, into the bank, you know, so there's no, no, no profit for shareholders or something like that. Well, the profit is there in the sense that we get um, bank transactions at very low rates um, uh, and all of that. This one thing that, well, two things that we still don't have, you know, this bank, uh, you, you can't issue bank cards, like a credit card or a chip card, anything like that, and it can't do internet banking, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they, it's not possible for them to do it yet, you know, well, they're not allowed to do those so things. Well, Although sometimes I do, of course I, I mail them, could you please transfer this from this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's a system that people work with in Iran, yeah, you know, you, you phone the bank, or you email them, or you walk into the bank, and, and they do transactions for you. you know, debit orders, all kinds of things, you know, they can do all of that. At a very low transaction cost, um, uh, and people earn good interest rates for their savings. Um, they but the, so owners borrow, the business owners borrow from the bank, you yes. support them, you yes. give yeah. them loans, and so on. Why do you you just go into the aura, and, uh, the aura and yes. Talk, yes. talk about that? Yes, so in 2003, I think, if I'm correct. Um, the decision was made after a lot of, of research and, and thinking about it to create our own currency for Aura, yeah? um, the Aura. Now, we are not allowed to call it a currency. Um, again, the Reserve Bank knows about it. Uh, they approve of what we have. They're okay with what we have because we don't want to make enemies with them. But they call it a coupon. <laughs> That's the term for it, but it's for us okay. Most people in Rwanda use the Aura. Um, why do we have the world? Why we went through all the trouble to create this and every two or three years print new notes and all of that? Few reasons. The one is we want pe we want money to stay locally, money to circulate locally in our local economy. And when you've got an aura uh, and you in Kimberley and you open your wallet, oh, you can't use that. You know, you can only use it in Iran. Or you are, will have to exchange it here with the bank again if you want to spend it outside. So we don't restrict people in the sense that they can exchange it for rands. But if you've got an aura, you can only spend the aura locally in Urania, and that leads to more people um, using their money uh, locally. The other thing is that for every aura, uh, there's a rand that backs it. Now, in the sense, now, for now that's good. In the future, we want to also change that to rather have it backed by gold or whatever, you know. But currently, it's a rand.